Well, thank you. It's a joy and a privilege to be able to address people with the gospel, but particularly brother pastors. Thank you so much for taking the time out of the ministries the Lord has called you to and entrusted you with, and uh, entrusting that to, to this group for a few days to be able to think and pray together about these matters. And there are no more important matters we could talk about. I have to tell you honestly, when John Piper calls you and asks you to speak on evangelism, I'm just thinking, I'd rather come here and sit and listen to John speak. But all right, but if Christianity is down to this on evangelism, we're in pretty bad shape. You know, George Bush eight years ago came to Washington saying, uh, I'm a uniter, not a divider. Uh, You get to choose if that's what ended up happening. But I know that I have had the odd, odd experience when it comes to evangelism of actually helping to divide groups, supposedly evangelical Christians, over the gospel. I have done that kind of unintentionally in my life at least three times that I can think of, maybe four. I'll tell you about one of them. I was invited to be part of a council. And this council would sit around every year for a week and talk about the doctrine of the church. Uh, People from all different evangelical denominations. uh, And we met at a seminary and we would sit and we would talk. In the second year of this activity, I began to think, you know, I don't really know what he means by the gospel. Because what he's saying doesn't sound like the kind of thing that I mean by the gospel. Now, I know we're all supposed to be evangelicals and may seem like a divisive question to raise, but I just think there's not any point in us talking about anything else if we don't agree on the gospel. So I put up my hand and I said, you know, excuse me, I'm just... Could, could we just take five minutes? I, I'm sure it'll only take five. Can we just take five minutes and write up on the whiteboard what we think the gospel is? Now, I honestly did think that would be met with approval. I thought the guy running the meeting, who was a kind of businessy guy, might be a little upset at the time. But I thought, you know, it's not going to take long. People are going to like it. They're going to see the agreement we have. Well, he was very reluctant. And then as we got started, it became evident why he was so reluctant. Friends, we didn't agree on what the gospel was. So when John says you got three talks, I pray about it, I think about it, I cannot think of what else I must talk about in this first talk other than what the gospel is. I just want to be clear. And listen, if you think you already know the gospel, I'm guessing you do too. But if you really know the Lord that the gospel is about, you will enjoy sitting here and just meditating on how the Lord has loved us in Christ. You know, one of the favorite things I do in taking a new member is I usually teach the membership class, the first one, which is on our church's statement of faith. And I love to do it because basically I'm going over the gospel with people. I'm explaining it and seeing if there are questions. And when we come to the article on justification by faith alone, I always say, now listen, this is the most important thing we're going to say all weekend. How you hear and understand this may be the difference in your eternity. So please, even if you if you don't listen to anything about the Sabbath or the Southern Baptist Convention, please listen to what I'm going to say right now. Well, brothers, that's that's what I feel we have here in considering the gospel. Uh, What is the gospel? And I say that because you know I do travel around some, and I we don't have cable TV at home, but it's in the hotels, and I turn on and I watch those channels that I shouldn't watch. And what I mean is not the bad stuff, that that's bad stuff. I mean the religious bad stuff. <laughs> Just horrible. But I, I have this odd fascination with it. I can't, I can't turn away. <laughs> you know, I, I can't see it at home, but when I travel, I can, I can look at it. And, you know, I'm seeing, I'm seeing ideas of Christianity. Like Christianity is that religion out there that says, don't worry, calm down. Do you have high blood pressure? Be a Christian. It's going gonna, it's gonna to lower that problem for you. <laughs> Friends, I, I, see, I see others that get up there and very legalistically talk about Rabbi Jesus. And they're all into Jewish backgrounds. And they're saying, what we want to do is live like Jesus lived. Well, I mean, that's kind of true, but there's no gospel in that by itself. That's just furthering my ticket to hell. 
And then there are the religious sophisticates who say, ah, you evangelicals, you've been too individualistic in your piety. We need to talk about global transformation. That's the gospel. Stop talking about just individual, you know, pick me up out of the trash heap, take me to heaven stuff. Well, I, I just want to clear our heads because there are a lot of faces out there that are doing a lot of things in the name of Jesus. And in the next two talks, I want to talk about the pastor and the church in evangelism. And I'll do more, maybe some stories and other kind of things you, you'd ask about, John. But I want to make sure that we're on the same page with this. And I would like to further encourage you, when I'm done with this talk, we pray that you go out. If you have friends you've come with, talk to them about the gospel. Check in with each other. Make sure you're understanding it the same way. So in order to be clear on this, I'm starting here. It is glorious. It's the, the very heart of what we're called to do. And it is the heart of the hope that we have in Scripture. So I pray that your hearts will be warmed as you consider it. And I think you'll find, at least in my experience, the more I study the gospel itself, the more I find myself excited about it and desiring to tell others about it. I used to be an agnostic and I became a Christian. And I was an argumentative agnostic. There are a lot of reasons the Lord should not have saved me. A lot of them. And those are, are pretty much in the front of my mind. I am so thankful that He did. And I want to be able to meditate on what it means that He saved me in order to, to push me out to be a more faithful messenger of that. Also, the more you meditate on the gospel, and I think especially the more you help your people in your congregation meditate on the gospel, the easier they will find evangelism. Because they'll think it through more. They'll, they'll see how it influences this area in life and that area in life. And the more familiar they become with it, the more they see the implications of what this means and that means, the more naturally the conversation at the workplace can be turned when someone brings up a tragedy in their life or a question about the future or what to do about the recession or any number of things. Christians have a magnificent, a magnificent armory for conversation that leads to God in the gospel. You, you can pick up almost any part of it. You know, just picking up anthropology for a moment, all right? Do our people and our churches understand that we believe everybody is made in the image of God? Now what that means is, one, one of the thousands of implications of that is, we're not surprised when anyone does something good. We don't have to think someone like Mozart was a Christian in order to compose beautiful music. He could have been a very foul human being. But he was still made in the image of God. We're, we're not shocked when a friend who basically at work has not been nice to anybody does some amazing kind act because that person is made in the image of God. And yet, you know, Christians also have in our understanding of, of, of humanity the idea of sin. That we have sinned and fallen short and that has affected, that fall in, in our first parents has affected all of us radically. So that there is no one that we expect, expect will be fundamentally good and loving. And so we know that all of us in this cursed world, even those of us that are redeemed, have the capacity to do great evil. So it's not that Christians then are stoic or unmoved, but we have a worldview in the gospel itself which addresses what we read about in the headlines, what we experience in our lives, the joys and tragedies of our friends better than any other worldview in the world. And the more we meditate that, on that and think of that, and the more we help our people to understand it, the more we are equipping them for evangelism. Now, a, a special note on being clear on the gospel, because I think one thing I have noticed that has declined over the years is a willingness to offend people in the gospel. I don't know how many conferences or seminars I have been at on contextualization. And I'm not opponent, an opponent of contextualization. We are all in our cultures. We all need to learn to translate, that, and that's all true. But friends, we're not translating well if we think we translate well when the non-Christian likes the gospel. No, we lost something if that's the case. No, we know we're translating well when the offense has been kept. When they are properly offended when we make it clear what the good news is and what it entails for them. The claims of Christ will certainly include translating, or our desire to share them will certainly include translating these things into understandable language. But what, what it, that does not mean is that it will be translated into terms that our hearers will like. We could go to almost any place in the New Testament for this. 
But if we could just go to Acts chapter 2 for a moment. You've got Pentecost. You know, the, the, in one sense, the first occasion of evangelism. And look at Peter. Now, Peter wanted to be relevant. He didn't want to speak in an unknown tongue, untranslated to those people who are standing there. But that relevance gave his words more bite, not less. How did Peter witness to those he wished to see saved? Well, look down there, verse 36. Acts chapter 2, verse 36. He said to them, among other things, Let all Israel be assured of this. God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. Now I ask you, is that relevant language? Yes. Yeah, they'd just done it. I mean, they could remember. Was it pleasing language? No, not at all. Was it clear? Yeah, undoubtedly, that was clear. I mean, it was a very serious charge he was laying at them. He wasn't just charging them with murder. He was charging them with taking their 1,500 years of national family history and taking the very point of it and had missed it so badly that they crucified their very Messiah that their whole society was built on waiting for. That's how Peter began his evangelism in Jerusalem. Now, friends, I'm not telling you you can tell if you're being faithful by how much you offend people, all right? (laughs) We can be very, very offensive needlessly. I'm not advocating that. But I am saying there is no painless way to tell someone that they are under the wrath of God. So, I want us to begin our time together by considering just exactly what we mean by the gospel. And of course, these days we very much have to begin with creation. We cannot assume anything. This world and our lives in it are part of God's plan. God created this world and all that's in it, and He created people. We see in Genesis 1, God created man in His own image. In the image of God, He created him. Male and female, He created them. I remember once talking to a Jewish friend at a French fry stand in, uh, in a mall on the North Shore of Boston. You'll find a lot of my evangelism stories will circulate around places that one eats. And uh, I remember I, I started to talk to him about God, and I realized that I don't think Michael means the same thing I do by God. And so I just said, now, Michael, when I say God, I, I know what I mean. What, what do you hear? What, what do you think I mean? I have found talking to non-Christians about evangelism one of the best ways to help me evangelize. You know, they're not stupid. They know we're doing it to them. They see the nervous look in our eyes. They hear the quickened pace in our voice. I I have found many times a lot of anxiety gets let out of the conversation if I just began talking to a non-Christian friend about, now listen, you know I'm a Christian. I really want to explain this to you. I want you to understand Christianity. I think this is the most important thing I can tell to you. Is there any way you think I could do this would be most helpful for you? I don't know how many times I've said things like that to people. I'm surprised at what things I do have to explain. And sometimes as pastors, we are necessarily, by the calling of God, in the middle of Christians all the time. And we forget what sounds strange to the world. The whole idea of the world's in rebellion. Uh, Though Adam and Eve, of course, made in the image of God. They had entire freedom to live in earthly paradise and friendship and trust with God. They chose not to. And in that choice to sin, catastrophe befell all of us. Romans 5, one trespass led to condemnation for all men. Our fellowship with God was broken. So instead of His right pleasure, we now faced His right wrath. Uh, We don't apologize for God's wrath. His his wrath is right. It is correct. But because of our first parent sin, we now face that. So because God's love for His creation is directed by His love for Himself, His blessings and His punishments are always consistent with His own commitment to holiness. When I have new members in a membership interview share the gospel in 60 seconds or less, which I always ask them to do, in a membership interview. And they talk about the cross as if God had to do this to obey the law. I, I, always, I always try to correct their, their language or change it a little bit just to highlight God chose to do this. 
God was not constrained by some law of holiness external to Himself. God Himself is holy. God will act in complete goodness. That's part of who God is. We need to understand that as we consider our own rebellion. So through this sin, we all died spiritually and the entire world was affected. The world over which we had reigned as God's lieutenants was cursed. As Paul says in Romans 8, the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of Him who subjected it. Now friends, we have to make this bad news part clear or there's no point for the good news. How many times do we tell somebody that they need to be saved when if they were being honest in their minds, they'd say, well, saved from what? We assume that. We've got to be clear on God's creation, our responsibility, and that we have defaulted on that. But God, would, who would have been perfectly just to have left matters there, didn't. Instead, God would redeem His people, set free His creation from its subjugation to sin and the curse. How? Well, by bringing what Isaiah called the gospel or the good news to his people. And what would that good news be? That God redeemed his people, as Peter says, by the precious blood of Christ. It is this good news that Jesus Christ calls us all to repent and believe. And all those who truly believe will be redeemed. Now, what about the rest of creation? Well, we read in Romans 8, verse 21, the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to decay and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. The heavens and the earth are destroyed and made new. We see in 2 Peter 3, and we see a glimpse of it in Revelation 21. We read the glorious culmination of this in the book of Revelation, where God's people, the redeemed, are brought into the presence of God to live forever. So, you know, the, the, the city that comes down out of heaven is a cube. You think of the Holy of Holies. We are forever going to be in the presence of God. Completely, immediately, in an unadulterated fashion. Nothing, nothing between, uh, no mediator at that point needed. And that forever is our dwelling place. Now, we read this glorious culmination. We see life as it should be, literally as it was meant to be, lived. But I want you to notice that this larger story of creation, fall, redemption, consummation, by itself, without the little two or three sentences I threw in there about what we as individuals do, if we just tell this grand, larger story about what God will do with creation, it's no good news. I'm, I'm a kid pressing my nose against the window of the candy store. What does that have to do with me? I see God's going to do this, and God's going to do this, and God's going to do this. But what about me? So friends, when we share the gospel, we have to be sure and not just talk about a grand cosmic transformation that as we see the history of salvation throughout Scripture, we see this unfolding. We have to be able to remember, to not forget the little individual human sinner like you and me, that's hearing this. Because that is how we are included in the good news. So if we want to think about this being good news for us, we have to see how we individually can be part of the story. So if you go back and think about the gospel, let's go back to God for a minute. Who is it that saves? Let's center it around salvation, our individual salvation. Instead of the consummation of all creation, let's center it around our individual salvation. Who is it that saves? Well, it's God who saves. He's the one true God, the greatest of all beings, the one who brought us into existence, who himself exists eternally in three persons. He plans and acts, as it says in Ephesians, according to uh, him who works all things, rather, according to the counsel of his own will. That's to say, he acts according to his good pleasure at all times. So this God that we begin with is pleased with himself. We need to not present God as a beggar. Not desperate, not lonely. God was without fault, right in all of His ways, good and loving. And it was according to His own holy, good, loving, perfect plan that God has created. Now, sometimes people speculate that God created people, as I say, because He was lonely and He wanted some fellowship in the universe. But friends, meditate on the high priestly prayer of Jesus in John 17. 
Look at the fullness of the love of God that he refers to there in eternity. In verse 24, he even says, before the foundation of the world. There was a fullness of love in the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. There was no need in God that compelled him. He chose to create for, not to supply a deficiency in him, but rather as an outflow of his own pleasure, his own love. Thus he saw everything that he had made in Genesis 1, and he says it was very good. So this same God out of his pleasure created all that is. He created according to his own purposes, and he acts to save some who have rebelled against him. And this action, too, is not out of any kind of external constraint, but it is according to His great mercy, something inherent in the personality, the character of this God. It says in 1 Peter 1 that He caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Okay, so who then is it that God has so acted to save? Well, people, people made in His image, Genesis 1. What does that mean? Well, from Genesis 1, it means that we act a little bit like God. We are sub-rulers over His creation, subduing the creatures of the earth, reflecting God's good rule over us. Our authority is derived from God's. I think that's what Paul means in Ephesians 3. It's meant to reflect His own. But beyond just that function, there are other likenesses to God we've been given. We're spiritual beings. We're relational beings. We experience love. Like God, we communicate and establish relationships. Like God, our souls endure eternally. But the Bible also teaches there's been this an enduring effect of the sin of Adam and Eve in Genesis 3. And because of that sin, we are born fallen. Our problem is not essentially a lack of fulfillment or purpose. Oh, pastor, how many times in your sermons in the year 2008... Or in personal conversations with a non-Christian, did you try to go at somebody's lack of purpose thinking that's your main way in for the gospel? Talk with your friends about that afterwards. I certainly think a non-Christian can experience a lack of purpose. But I think in this fallen world, so can a Christian. I also know a lot of non-Christians who feel like plenty full on the purpose category. You know, they're living their life, they know what they're about, and they're happy in their sins. I'd be very careful. What we want to do when we present the gospel, and we'll talk about this more later, but I think we want to be very clear that we're not waiting upon them feeling a sense of need. We're there as a herald, letting them know that there is a God who made them, and there is a God to whom they will give an account. So whether or not they understand themselves at this moment to be interested, we have very important news for them. They will die. They will give account to their Creator because He is their judge. And they'll find when they do that they've sinned. They've sinned against Him. And that this judge is good. And so He will punish them. And they need a Savior. We need to be very careful how we approach them to reflect accurately who God is. So because of that sin, we're born fallen. Our problem is not just a lack of fulfillment or purpose. Our problem is our sin. Our problem is our rejection of God. We are naturally turned away from God and toward sin and the various sins in our life. We're not as bad as we could possibly be, but we now are all sinners and we do sin in all areas of life. We are corrupted. We make the wrong choices. We are not holy. We are, in fact, inclined to evil. Therefore, we are under just condemnation to eternal ruin without defense or excuse. We're guilty of sinning against God, fallen from His favor under the curse of Genesis 3 and the promise of His right judgment of us in the future and forever. So friends, this is the state that we need saving from. And we must be clear about this. Now, when that's clear, and some Puritans, I think, went overboard on this. They would take the work of preparation and they would hold it out without the gospel, beat them up with the law for for weeks and months. And while there may be some of us, like myself, who actually needed that, I don't assume that that's most people that I'm dealing with. But when we have a sense of our, our sin, or at least when the person next to you on the plane 
seems to understand that you're saying their problem is not their discontent with themselves, it's God's discontent with them. That's an awkward thing to make clear in a civil conversation on an airplane. But friends, that's the kind of thing we have to get clear to them. Right? So then who would save us? And it's then, when we were in that desperate state, helpless, then that God loved us. As we've just been singing gloriously about. He loved us and sent His Son to be the propitiation for our sins. As John says in 1 John 4. The eternal Son of God became a man. He was born Jesus, Son of the Virgin Mary. Jesus entered the world with a purpose. He came to give His life as a ransom for many, it says in Mark 10. He was not an unwitting or an unwilling sacrifice, which is why you don't want to use the train conductor. The bridge is out. He can switch the train, but it'll kill his son who's trapped on the tracks. I don't think you want to use that illustration. It does illustrate a father's willingness to give his son's life. That is true, very movingly. But it makes it seem like the son's sacrifice is unwitting not his own will, where Jesus was so clear in saying that he chose to lay down his life. The Garden of Gethsemane shows that his sacrifice was a willing one for us. It was the Trinity acting in concert for our good. So we see that God has loved us like this in Jesus. Jesus was fully God throughout the time of his life on earth. Jesus himself clearly taught that his deity uh, was, was the case. He was fulfilling prophecy about the Lord. He was fulfilling prophecies associated with the coming of God Himself. You know, if you have Jehovah's Witnesses, don't take them to John 1. Take them to Mark 1. Where in Mark 1, you see the evangelist quoting about John the Baptist that he would prepare the way for whom? The Lord, Yahweh. Who is Mark clearly quoting that about? John the Baptist. Who would prepare the way for whom? Jesus. They might wiggle around with the anarchic, whatever it is in John 1. They're not, there's no wiggle room in Mark 1. So take your Jehovah's Witnesses, friends, to Mark chapter 1 to show clearly that Jesus understood himself and the early Christians, his disciples, understood what he was teaching on this, that he was God incarnate. He had come to forgive sins. Jesus accepted worship. He taught that he and the Father were one. But Jesus Christ was also fully man. He was no deity just play-acting like he was human. Jesus actually was fully human. He was born, and he lived in submission to his parents. He had a fully human body. He grew, it says in Luke 2, and became strong, filled with wisdom. He learned to trade. He was a carpenter, we know, in Mark chapter 6. He experienced hunger, felt thirst and tiredness, faced temptation, eventually even suffered death itself. You can't get more human than that. Jesus Christ was fully God and fully man. Now, why did He take on flesh? Why was He incarnate? The eternal Son of God became a man in order to save sinners. Jesus Christ lived a perfect life. Indeed, all His actions were as they should be. His words were perfect. He said only what the Father commanded. We read in John 12, What I say, therefore, I say as the Father has told me. He did only what the Father willed. So the writer to the Hebrews concludes, We do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Jesus lived the life that Adam and Eve could have lived, that we all should have lived. He deserved no punishment from God because He was never disobedient to God. Jesus came to teach God's truth, especially about Himself. He taught the truth about God, about His relationship with God the Father, about sin about us, about what He'd come to do, what we must do in response. He explained that the Scriptures of the Old Testament pointed to Him. But God sent Him especially to die for us. Friends, that's what we see in John chapter 3. That's what we see in Mark 10, 45. This is how God has shown His love for us. Christ gave His life as a ransom for us. Jesus Christ's crucifixion was a horrible act of violence by the people who rejected, sentenced, mocked, tortured, and crucified Him. And yet it was also a display of the self-giving love of God. As the Son of God bore the penalty of God's wrath against us for our sins, He bore it all. 
I love that line, and it is well. My sins, not in part, but the whole, he nailed to the cross. I bear them no more. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, O my soul. How do we know that's true? Friends, on the third day after his crucifixion, Jesus was raised from the dead by God. This demonstrated an acceptance of Christ's claims In his ministry, it showed God's acceptance of his sacrifice for all those who would repent and believe. He ascended then to heaven and the angel said, we'll come back, Acts chapter 1, in the same way you have seen him go. Christ's return will bring God's plan of salvation to completion. All right, so if this is what God has done in Christ, what are we to do to be saved? We are saved from God's right wrath against our sins through the death of Christ as we repent of our sins and trust in Christ. Sometimes we get tripped up because we think of these as sort of two separate acts. There are some people who even talk about believing, having faith, without repenting. Now, I want to be as charitable as I can here. I think they do that because they have the continuing experience in their lives as Christians of sin. So they understand that their repentance is not perfect, it's not complete. Yet I think they badly misunderstand what the New Testament teaches by separating those acts. I think repentance and faith in the New Testament are meant to be two sides, two aspects of the same act. As when I come to Minneapolis. Well, implied in that is I left Washington. Right? So in setting up the bad news, I've made it clear I'm not with God. I'm not turned toward God. I'm at enmity with God. So if I'm going to come to God, be reconciled to Him, that means I have to turn from my sins to be oriented to Him, to trust in Him. In the Old Testament, God commands people to turn or return, shuv, and so be saved. In the New Testament, Christ preached that people should Turn to God. Paul summarized his preaching with that phrase. Paul preached in Acts 26 that they should repent and turn to God, performing deeds in keeping with their repentance. Or as as Paul said earlier in Acts 20, he preached testifying both to Jews and to Greeks of repentance toward God and of faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. So friends, to repent means to turn. And the turning that we are called to do in order to be saved is fundamentally one of turning to God. James could refer to the Gentiles who turned to God in Acts chapter 15. So to turn in this sense in the Bible is to orient your life towards someone else, toward toward someone that your life had not been oriented to. As God's people, those who are being saved, we are to play the part of the prodigal son who flees to the Father, who turns away from the life of rebellion and runs to the Father. Paul at Lystra calls people to turn to the living God in Acts 14. Or in Galatians chapter 4, Paul refers to Christians as those who had come to know God. Friends, this is what we do in repentance. It just means that we, we, we repent from our sins, of our sins. We repent by turning to God. So turning to God necessarily implies our turning away from sin. I was at a, a, a mega church of a leading evangelical theologian whose eldership was divided on this point. I don't understand that. But if you're divided on this point, I promise this would be a very important thing for you to try to settle with the fellow elders and pastors in your congregation. Is repentance part of what we have to do in order to respond savingly to the gospel? I think the whole Bible, for Old and New Testaments, clearly teaches that to repent is to, as Solomon says in 1 Kings, acknowledge your name and turn from their sins. We can't continue to pursue God and sin at the same time. 1 John makes it clear that our basic way of life will be either oriented toward God and His light or toward the darkness of sin. Christians in this life will still sin. Believe me, I understand that. I understand that painfully in my own life and in the lives of those that I love and pastor. But our lives aren't guided and directed by it. I love the um, image that William Arnott gives in his commentary on the Proverbs, where he says, look, the difference between the Christian and the non-Christian is not that the non-Christian sins, 
and the Christian doesn't. But it's that when the non-Christian sins and God's Spirit convicts him, he takes the part of his sins against God's Spirit. Whereas when the Christian sins and God's Spirit convicts him, he takes the part of God's Spirit against himself and his own beloved sins. Friends, that's what I think 1 John is talking about. When we are walking in the light, we're no longer enslaved to sin. Yes, we still struggle, but we have been freed from its domineering power. And there's evidence in our lives that we have been freed. That we have known the transforming influence of the Holy Spirit at work in us. God gives us, of course, the gift of repentance. All of this is gift. In Acts chapter 11, verse 18, it's clear the apostles understood the repentance of the Gentiles to be a gift given by God. So, now this repentance is part of our faith response to the gospel. Put another way, our response is to believe or trust God's promises in Christ. Among Jesus' first words in Mark's gospel are repent and believe. The obedience that typifies God's people, repentance, is to result from the trust that we have in God. How we believe what He says to us. We have faith. Why faith? Is faith just the arbitrary coin of the realm? Friends, no. Look at what Adam and Eve didn't do with God in the garden. They didn't believe His words. They faithed the words of the serpent more than God's words. So if we're going to reestablish that relationship, God didn't just arbitrarily hold out mercy or hold out some other kindness as the coin that He would accept as part of the gospel. No, he said, believe. Exactly what Adam and Eve did not do in the garden with every evidence in the world to believe and trust. It's what he calls us yet again to do if we would reestablish that relationship with him. Sins are called sometimes in the Old Testament breaking faith with God. So having faith in God is the means by which, having faith in Christ, is the means by which God accounts Christ's righteousness our own. We see in Galatians 2 and in Romans 3. Paul could refer to salvation through faith in Christ in 2 Timothy 3. So being saved is referred to as receiving the words of truth or Peter's words in a sermon in Acts 2 as he preached the good news of Jesus Christ. So such saving faith is something that we exercise, but even so, it is a gift from God. Paul writes in Ephesians 2, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this not of your own doing, it is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. Now, at the same time, Paul explained that he has known internal battle. In Romans 7, I do not do what I want, but I do the very thing I hate. Paul would not have any good desires apart from faith in God and His promises. Not those desires for God and obedience to Him. And yet, through a saving relationship that God had established, that relationship was begun, initiated, not yet perfected in this life. God's gift of salvation has been given to Christians, but that salvation is lived out in the continuous work of God's Spirit. So as Christians, we can deceive ourselves. And so that's why Paul encourages Christians in 2 Corinthians 13, examine yourselves to see whether you are in the faith. Test yourselves. Now friends, that verse makes no sense to many modern American evangelical Christians. Test yourselves? See whether or not you're in the faith? What does that mean? Does that just mean remember the date on which I was converted? I remember I had a church member who one time looked at me after I'd been there a couple years, an older lady, and she said, just out of the blue in the church office, she said, Pastor, I don't think you think I'm saved. I had never said that to her. I hadn't said it to anybody. I really didn't even think that. I thought she probably was saved. But she just kept going anyway. She said, well, I can remember it as clearly as if it was yesterday. When I was a little child, someone gave me a book of colors. And the first page was black for my sins. And the second page was the red blood of Jesus that covered my sins. And the next page was white, white as snow I'd been washed. And then the last page was golden for the golden streets of heaven. Why, I can remember it as clearly as if it were yesterday. And I said to her, I called her by name, and I said, look, nowhere in the New Testament are you called to look back at a certain date to tell whether or not you're a Christian. You're called to look today at the evidence of God the Holy Spirit's work in your life. That's how we know we're alive. That's why it's not nonsense for Paul to write to the Corinthians, test yourself, examine yourselves to see if you be in the faith. We need to understand that with this gospel that we present. 
Peter encourages Christians to grow in godliness and so become more confident of our election. In 2 Peter chapter 1, we don't create our own salvation by our actions. We reflect it. We give evidence of it. And so we gain certainty of it. Because we're able to deceive ourselves, we Christians give ourselves to the study of God's Word, to be instructed. We join local churches. I've described a local church sometimes as an assurance of salvation, cooperative. You know, it's where we get to know each other. We really let them into our lives so people can see, is there evidence of the work of God's Spirit here, or am I just fooling myself? Jesus' description of His followers, or Paul's list of the fruit of the Spirit in in Galatians 5, serve as spiritual maps which are supposed to help us in this. So God's plan is to save His people from their sins, to, to bring His people to Himself. Christians experience salvation in this life in a past sense, present sense. We anticipate the final completion of the work gloriously with God forever. So the holy God saves sinful people by sending His Son to die as a substitute, bearing the sins of everyone that would repent of their sins and trust in Him. And so we who do repent and trust are saved from our own sin against God and from God's just punishment of us. And for convicted sinners like us, this is good news. I'm done with that. All right? That's the gospel. I've tried to go over it very slowly, and I've tried to step on as many toes as possible. Because if there's something that you're looking at that, that maybe you're not understanding quite right or is not quite what the Bible teaches or you bought into a popular error, I want to try to help serve you by bringing that to your attention. As best as I can tell, this is the gospel. Friends, you should love teaching this to your people. Um, now, I don't teach it to my people in that kind of systematic, concentrated fashion. Uh, it just comes out in the exposition of Scripture. Uh, wherever I'm preaching through, whether it's Philippians or you know, Romans or Ezra or Revelation, uh, this is the message that's at the center of the message. This is the message that we want to give our people, the gospel. The other thing then I want us to think about, having just looked at the gospel afresh, is all right, then why should we share this gospel? Why should we share this message that we've just talked about at length? Well, I mean, the very nature of the message seems to answer the question. But just to help out, let me give three reasons, all right? Three reasons. I trust you can think of more, but let me just give you three and dwell on those. First, a desire to be obedient to God's commands. When we read the Bible, we see that evangelism isn't an idea thought up by some traveling revivalists or some marketing specialists. It was the risen Lord Jesus Christ who commanded His disciples, Matthew 28, to go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And we know from the book of Acts that this is exactly what those early disciples did. Paul refers to his own compulsion to preach the gospel. This was an obligation that he had been given. To evangelize was to obey. So, friend, you can say, well, I don't really feel like doing this. Yeah, I'm not talking about that. I would like you to work on your affections, but don't wait for your affections. Work on your affections, but don't wait for your affections. It wasn't only these original disciples that that command was given to, and we can tell because as you go on in Acts, you see other people evangelizing. We read in Acts chapter 8, verse 4, those who had been scattered preached the word wherever they went. Well, maybe that's just referring to the apostles or maybe the elders. No, because we know later in that chapter, Philip the deacon was evangelizing the Ethiopian official. One of the clearest examples of evangelism being commanded in the New Testament is in 1 Peter in chapter 3, where Peter commands young Christians generally to be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. And doing this is said to be part of setting apart Christ as Lord that is of obeying Him. So even as the Apostle holds out Christ as an example for us in so many places, so the apostolic example of Paul, his own self-giving sacrifice, challenges us. I think a lot of times when we hear a command to love, we define it in very convenient ways. But a good word I've found to make love bite in my own sermons with my own congregation is to encourage them to think of what would be inconvenient for you. And try to love in that way. Try to love in ways that you might not be naturally disposed to or your schedule naturally programmed for. Now, friends, we need to realize that we should be challenged by the opening verses of of Romans 9. 
where Paul talks about people who don't know Christ, and he clearly sees the obligation that he has. We feel that logic of Romans 10. You know, how shall they, if no one is, how shall they, if no one is? And friends, that's a clear call to us. We realize that our silence is not a matter of neutrality. And you need to tell yourself that. Our silence is a matter of guilt and sin. Obedience is definitely a biblical reason to evangelize. But mentioning Romans 9, that gets us into another one, another reason to evangelize, a second one, a love for the lost. Almost sounds quaint to use that word lost. I wonder how many of us seriously use that word in our sermons. One poll that I read recently said one half of 1% of Americans said that there's the slightest chance they'll end up in hell. Friends, one half of 1%. But though it's not felt very deeply or spoken of very passionately in our time, is there any more serious business? Consider what we mean by lost. And preachers, we have got to stop skipping or avoiding this topic or making it sound trite or or trifling. Sinners liable to fall under God's judgment. It was Jesus who spoke of God's wrath remaining on everyone who doesn't believe in Him. Richard Sibbs, the great Puritan, said that outside of Christ, God is terrible. You understand what he meant. He wasn't morally evaluating God negatively. He was saying that God will cause terror in us if we appear in his presence outside of Christ and Christ's blood shed for us. God's wrath comes upon us because of our sin. And that wrath will be terrible. Apart from God's grace, the sinner will never stop sinning as best I can tell, reading the book of Revelation. Refusing and rejecting God. People who try to take the C.S. Lewis line, well, it's just what they want. I don't think so. I understand there's a sense in which that's true, but it goes far beyond that. I don't think that people gnashing their teeth are happy that they're gnashing their teeth. I don't think they're choosing that. No, God's judgment will never end. Their rejection of God never ends. His judgment never ends. We all know God's law. We all break it. I remember one time when I was giving an evangelistic address. When I lived in England for seven years, and I was over in Oxford giving an evangelistic address. And I was talking to a student leader just walking along the streets before I went to give the talk. And he told me that he was thinking a lot about annihilationism, the idea that maybe the non-Christian just ceases to exist when they die. And he said he liked that because it, it made God seem more humane. And I said, look, can you think of any reason why we want to make God's judgment seem less terrible to sinners? I mean, even if you were right, and biblically it's certainly not right, but even if you were right... Do you want to make the rebellious sinner against God's kind and loving rule feel better about his rebellion? Is there any way we want to make hell seem less terrible? Friend, we can use whatever metaphor, whatever language, whatever analogy, whatever image, quote whatever biblical verse we will. I promise the experience of hell will be worse than any abuse any of us have ever suffered in our lives. We're talking about eternal God who made us, who knows us. Heaven is lost. The conscience is awakened. Remorse and regret are given rule as desires roam free in our lives and are never satisfied. All the cravings of the body will remain and will go unmet. God will pour out His wrath on the unforgiven in order to inflict pain, extreme and unnatural pain in them forever. Friends, I, 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 I find words fail me in trying to describe how bad hell must be. Because every moment I'm doing it, I'm standing here as a Christian and dwelt by His Spirit, knowing His kindness and His grace. I can read His Word, but even then, I think of before I was a Christian, I experienced God's kindness in giving me life and breath, a family, the ability to see, to hear, to have relationships. Friends, it's very difficult for us in reading God's Word to begin to have any idea of how horrible it must be 
to fall under the judgment of God forever. And as preachers of the gospel, we have no business trying to make God seem just or fair or more humane to unbelievers who are in revolt against Him. That's a losing proposition. Don't do it. Tell them how horrible it is. Friends, just consider your own conscience. What if it were let loose upon you forever? Acts 4.12, as we were just singing, says that there's no other name. There's no other name given under heaven by which we must be saved. Saved from what? Saved from our lostness, our sin, now and eternally. Paul in Philippians 3 describes the non-Christian just in the present, saying that their destiny is destruction. Their God is their stomach. Their glory is in their shame. Their mind is on earthly things. Revelation chapter 20 makes it clear that finally, if anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he, this one made in the image of God, he, no worse than you and me. Oh, why was I a guest? He was thrown into the lake of fire. And this is the unending punishment of God for our sin because God is truly and forever good. All of those wrongs that no one else has ever noticed, God has noticed. God will be just. And endless sin, we have no reason to believe the sin of the unregenerate, as I say, ceases at death. Endless sin will certainly be punished endlessly. God is good. And we by ourselves are not. We are fallen in Adam. The analogy between God and earthly parents is incomplete at this point. The earthly parent shares with the child they would only punish, shares rather with the child that they would punish their earthly sins. It's a sinner publishing another sinner, or rather punishing another sinner. The earthly parent then is not a perfect analogy for God. Even our forgiveness is made possible by the fact that on the one hand, God has forgiven the sins of His own people because the penalty for their sins has fallen on Christ. And on the other hand, because justice will be done, vengeance is His. He will repay, He says. Jesus Himself at least implies that the pains of the damned will endure as long as the joys of the saved. In Matthew 25, verse 46, both the punishment of the lost and the life of the saved are described with the same word, aeonion meaning eternal, everlasting. Now, ours is an age that is sensitive to human suffering. Connie and I were talking the other day about how uh, Calvin just suffered terribly in his life, just physically. And how actually our medicines probably make us even more sensitive to pain in some ways and less able to bear it at the same time. Because we just naturally think today there's a way to fix this pain, to stop it and go on where those saints who came before these times of medicine and anesthesia had to endure all manner of pain and continue on in faith, functioning through the day. And this age of ours that's so sensitive to pain and to suffering, that suffering that we're so sensitive to is just the physical suffering in this life that will end. But friends, as the writer to the Hebrews says, it is a dreadful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Friends, the lost will be tormented as long as God is good, as long as He lives. Hell is, as Edward Payson said, a fire which cannot be quenched unless God should change or cease to exist. Paul says to the Thessalonians, He will punish those who do not know God and do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus. They will be punished with everlasting destruction and shut out from the presence of the Lord and the majesty of His power. Jesus said things like this in Mark 9 about their worm not dying and the fire not being quenched precisely to do what, at least in, I know some seminaries, we've been taught not to do. Alarm our hearers. Jesus did not preach a don't worry Christianity. He preached a be worried You need a Savior. When you're in God's universe, the most important thing for you to make sure of is how that God feels about you. You will stand before that God. Brothers, we are lost. We are by nature in a miserable estate. Not only is the end of the non-Christian bad, but all the way along before and after death, they're slaves to sin. Sometimes as Christians, we forget because we keep battling with sin, we forget the great freedom that we have known from sin's domination. And how wonderful it is that God the Holy Spirit has come in and has actually changed our hearts and lives. He took away my temper. 
He's done so many things in my life just to change me. And I'm so thankful for that. My non-Christian friends know none of that liberty of the Spirit. They have none of that sanctifying work of the Spirit. Spurgeon exhorted young ministers to meditate with deep solemnity upon the fate of the lost sinner. And like Abraham, when you get up early to go to the place where you commune with God, cast an eye toward Sodom and see the smoke thereof going up like the smoke of a furnace. Shun all views of future punishment which would make it appear less terrible. And so take off the edge of your anxiety to save immortals from the quenchless flame. The Puritan minister Daniel Burgess once shared in a sermon that, quote, My father, in all his letters, used to write to me, quote, O child, better never born than not newborn. Better never born than not newborn. I mentioned just a moment ago Edward Payson. Most of you won't have heard of him, perhaps. He was a congregational minister in the 1800s in, in Portland, Maine. His daughter was Elizabeth Prentice, who wrote Stepping Heavenward. Payson was a very faithful congregational minister. He preached gloriously on heaven. I found one sermon he preached on hell. I want to read you just a little bit of that now. Payson says, I cannot and must not, however, conclude without addressing a word my professing friends to you, and I hope you will bear with me. If in view of such a subject as this, I address you with apparent severity. An apostle teaches ministers that they must sometimes rebuke professing Christians sharply, but I trust my sharpness will be the sharpness of love. And I know that I shall say nothing to you half so severe as the reproaches which I have directed against myself while preparing this discourse. We all deserve perdition a thousand times for our stupid insensibility to the situation of those that are perishing around us. We profess to believe the Word of God, but can you all prove that you believe it? Do you all act as if you believed it? What? Believe that many of your acquaintances are in danger of the fate which has now been described? Dare you go to God and say, Lord, I believe thy word. I believe that all thy threatenings will be fulfilled. And then turn away and coolly pursue your worldly business without uttering one agonizing cry for those who are exposed to these threatenings? Dare you go and claim relationship to Christ and profess to have his spirit without which you are none of his and then make no effort or only a few faint efforts? to save those for whom he shed not only tears but blood? Go, I may say to such, go, inconsistent, cruel, hard-hearted professors. Go, slumber over the ruin of immortal souls. Wrap yourself up in your selfish temporal interests and say, I have no time to spare for rescuing others from everlasting burnings. Go, wear out your life in acquiring property for your children and leave their souls to perish in the fire that never shall be quenched. Go, adorn their bodies, and banish from them, if possible, the seeds of disease, but leave in their bosoms that immortal worm which will gnaw them forever. And when God asks, Where is thy child, thy brother, thy friend? Reply with impious Cain, I know not, I care not. Am I his keeper? Friends, again and again when you read biographies, you find that Christians are motivated by a love to others. Hudson Taylor said, I would never have thought of going to China had I not believed that the Chinese were lost and needed Christ. That sounds like Paul in Romans 10. D.L. Moody told an audience in London, if I believed there was no hell, I'm sure I would be off tomorrow for America. What does it mean to love a person and not share this news with them? It's people who are this lost, who have this fate awaiting them, that we are aiming to convert. Now, we have to understand what conversion is. If conversion is merely a sincere human commitment that we make, then we need to get everyone to the point of verbal confession and commitment any way we can. Biblically, though, while we are to care, to plead, to persuade, our first duty is to be faithful to give the message that we've considered this evening, to present that same good news that God has given to us. And God will bring conversions from our presenting this good news. God's Spirit will convert. We can't make conversions. And I think knowing this helps our evangelism. People always say Calvinists are bad evangelists. You know, Calvinism kills evangelism. Well, that's partly true. I do think Calvinists are bad evangelists. But I think Arminians are bad evangelists. I think we're all bad evangelists. We're bad evangelists because our flesh doesn't want to displease other people. Because we have other things that serve ourselves more nearly and better. And better. 
Friends, an analogy might be this. Think of two, two little kids told to, to make a drawing, all right? Um, and their teacher tells them they're to draw this particular thing. And this one, the first child, uh, thinks that he has to do it all on his own. And that he's got to get every tree and leaf and limb and blade of grass just exactly right. The second child listened when the master painter said, you put these basic elements in and I'll come and I'll finish your drawing for you. That first one is terrified they'll get it wrong. They do it once and with anxiety. The second child happily puts the tree and the branch and the leaf and the grass knowing that the master will come along behind and make it beautiful. And so that child asks for yet another sheet of paper and another and another and another all the time confident that the master will make up for it. Friends, I promise that anybody who's ever come to Christ through me has not come to Christ because I did such a great job presenting the gospel. I presented the only message that ever saves anybody. I did it imperfectly, and God the Holy Spirit came along, picked it up, and used it to their conversion. Praise God, we don't have to do everything exactly right to see somebody saved. I actually think that when we understand that, our evangelism goes up. I think we can then confidently and joyfully tell people the basic message of the gospel, knowing that God's Holy Spirit will in faithfulness pick that up and bring glory to Himself by converting sinners. If you want help in understanding this, I'm told there are 50 copies of J.I. Packer's Evangelism and the Sovereignty of God. This is a wonderful little book. I think understanding this, so far as it from damaging our evangelism, I think it frees us up to be more faithful and free and confident and joyful and regular evangelists. And I hope that your life is going to be evidence of that for people. Well, the last reason that we want to evangelize, and I'll be brief on this, the last reason is our love not just for the lost but for God. We want to see Him glorified. We want to see the truth about the Creator and His love and His mercy told in His creation. We want to see His reputation lifted up. Ultimately, our motive in evangelism is a desire to see God glorified. This was the end of all the Lord Jesus' actions. Read again His high priestly prayer in John 17. Again and again throughout Ezekiel, we read that phrase that that God will do this and then they will know that I am the Lord as God explains His salvation of His disobedient people. Jesus taught that the actions which were going to be done by those who followed him would bring glory to his father this is to my father's glory he said in john 15 that you bear much fruit showing yourselves to be my disciples everything exists for god's glory romans 11 our salvation is as paul put it in ephesians 1 to the praise of his glorious grace God does everything He does for His own glory. Everything we do then, we're to do for the glory of God, including our evangelism. So we share the gospel to glorify God as we tell the truth about His goodness and His mercy to His creation. And God is glorified in the gospel. Is there a more amazing message? How else could His righteousness and His mercy appear so clearly before His eyes than someone speak the truth about Him, about our rebellion about His love in Christ and His forgiveness and reconciliation brought to us. Friends, this is how God is glorified. To tell the truth about some people is not to honor them. I understand that. But to tell the truth about God is to honor Him. To tell the truth about God is to praise Him, is to glorify Him. Others coming to know the truth about Him and His desirability. This is why we Christians should be so zealous to share the truth the good news about Jesus Christ. The call to evangelism is a call to turn our lives outward. To turn our lives outward from focusing on ourselves and our needs to focusing on God. to focusing on those others made in His image who are still at enmity with Him. We bring glory to God in this way. And you know, this is our one special privilege here on earth, that we can bring glory to God in this way, in a way we won't be able to in heaven. Bring glory as we tell those creatures made in His image the truth about Him for their salvation. 
Let's pray together. <clears throat> Lord, you know all the reasons that we don't share your gospel with others. We thank you that you have forgiven us of our sin. We pray that you would cause our hearts to be inflamed with love for you and for others. We pray, Lord, that we would be faithful heralds. We thank you for your love in Christ. Oh, Lord, you've heard us sing this evening our praises to you. Oh, God, we pray by your Spirit you would make our lives and our lips more consistent with that message outside of meetings like this. Bless these days together to encourage us in evangelism. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.